Our next speaker, Aliza Esage, is an independent vulnerability researcher and has a notable re record of security research achievements such as the Sierra Day Initiative Silver Bounty Hunter Award 2018. Aliza is going to present her latest research on the Qualcomm Diac protocol, which is found <clears throat> abundantly in Qualcomm hexagon-based cellular modems. Aliza, we're looking forward to your talk now. This is Alisa Sage. You are attending my presentation, Advanced Hexagon Diac at Chaos Communication Congress 2020, Remote Experience. My main interest as an advanced vulnerability researcher is complex system and hardened systems. For the last 10 years, I have been researching various classes of software, such as Windows kernel, browsers, JavaScript engines, and for the last three years, I was focusing mostly on hyper users. The project, the project that I'm presenting today was a little side project that I made for destruction a couple of years ago. The name of this talk, Advanced Hexagon Diac, is a bit of an understatement in the attempt to keep this talk a little bit low key in the general internet because a big part of the talk will actually be devoted to uh, general vulnerability research in basements. But the primary focus of this talk is on the Hexagon Diag, also known as QCDM, Qualcomm Diagnostic Manager. This is a proprietary protocol developed by Qualcomm for use in their basements. And it is included on all Snapdragon socks and modem chips produced by Qualcomm. Modern Qualcomm chips run on a custom silicone with a custom instruction set architecture named QDSP6 Hexagon. This is important because uh, all the diac handlers that we will be dealing with are written in this instruction set architecture. As usually with my talks, I have adjusted the materials of this presentation for various audiences, for the full spectrum of audiences. Specifically, the first part of the presentation is mostly specialized for research directors and high-level high technical staff. And the last part is more deep technical and it would be mostly interesting to specialized vulnerability researchers and low-level programmers that somehow are related to this particular area. Let's start from the top level overview of cellular technology. This mind map presents a simplified view of various types of entities that we have to deal with with respect to basements. It's not a complete diagram, of course, but it only presents the uh, classes of entities that, uh, that exist in this space. Also, this uh, mind, map, mind map is specific to the client side equipment, the user equipment, and it completely omits any server side considerations which are a world in their own. There exists quite a large number of cellular protocols on the planet. From the user perspective, this is simple. This is usually the shared name 3G, 4G that you see on the mobile screen. But in reality, this simple name, that generation name, encodes, may encode uh, several different distant technologies. There are a few key points about cellular protocols that are crucial to understand before starting to approach this area. The first one is the concept of a generation. This is simple. This is simply the 1G, 2G and so on the generic name of a family of protocols that are supported at a particular generation. Generation is simply a marketing name it's, uh, for users. It doesn't really have any strict technical meaning. 
and generations represent the evolution of cellular protocols in time. The second most important thing about uh, cellular protocols is the air interface. This is or uh, the protocol which actually this is the lowest le level protocol which defines how exactly the uh, cellular signal, signal is digitized and read from the electromagnetic wave and how exactly the different players in this field divide the space. Historically, there existed two main implementations of this low-level protocol, TDMA and CDMA. TDMA means time division multiple access, which basically divides the entire electromagnetic spectrum within the radio band into time slots that are rotated in a round-robin manner by various um, mobile phones so that they speak um, in, in turns. The TDMA was the base for the GSM technology. And uh, GSM was the main protocol used on this planet for a long time. Another low-level implementation is CDMA. It was a little bit more complex from the beginning. It's decoded as uh, co-division multiple access. And instead of dividing the spectra by in time slots and dividing the protocol in bursts, CDMA uses uh, pseudo-random codes that are assigned to mobile phones so that um, uh, this code can be used as an additional randomizing ma mask against the modulation protocol and multiple user equipments can talk on the same frequency without interrupting each other. Notable here is that CDMA was developed by Qualcomm and it was mostly used in the United States. So at the level of uh, 2G there were two main protocols, GSM based on the TDMA and CDMA1 based on the CDMA. Uh, the third generation of mobile protocols, these um, two branches of development were continued. So GSM evolved into UMTS while CDMA1 evolved into CDMA2000. The important point here is that UMTS have at this point already adopted the low-level air interface protocol from the CDMA and eventually at the fourth generation of protocols these two branches of development come together to create the LTE technology and the uh, same for the 5G. This is a bit important for us as uh, from the offensive perspective because uh, first of all all of these technologies including the air interfaces represent separate uh, bits of code with uh, separate parsing algorithms within the baseband firmware and all of them are usually presented in each baseband regardless of which one do you actually use uh, does your mobile provider actually support. Another important and non obvious thing from the offensive security perspective here is that because of this um, evolutionary development, uh, the, the protocols are not actually completely distinct. So if you think about LT, it is not a completely different protocol from GSM, but instead it is based largely on the same internal structures. And in fact, if you look at the specifications, they some of them are almost directly relevant. The specifications of the GSM 2G, some of them are still directly relevant to some extent to LTE. This is also important when you start um, analyzing protocols from the offensive perspective. The cellular protocols are structured in a nested way, in, um, in layers. Uh, layers is the official terminology adopted by the specifications. With the exception of level zero, here I just added it for convenience. But in, in the specifications, layers start from one and proceed to three. From the offensive perspective, the most interesting is level three, as you can see from the screenshot of specifications, because it encodes most of the high level protocol data, such as handling SMS and GSM. This is the part of the protocol which actually contains in interesting data structures with, TL with TLV values and so on. 
When people talk about attacking basements, they usually mean attacking basement over the air. The OTA attack vector, which is definitely one of the most interesting. But let's take a step back and consider the entire big picture of the basement ecosystem. This diagram presents a um, unified view of um, generalized architecture of a modern basement with attack surfaces. First of all, there are two se separate distinct processors, the AP application processor and the MP, which is mobile processor. It may be in either a DSP or another CPU. Usually uh, there are two separate processors and each one of them runs a separate operating system. In case of the AP, it may be um, Android or iOS. And the basement processor would run some sort of a real-time operating system provided by the mobile vendor. Important point here that on modern implementations, basement are usually protected by some sort of secure execution environment, maybe Trust on Androids or CEPOS on Apple devices. Which means that the privilege boundary, which is depicted here on the left side, is dual-sided. So, even if you have kernel access to the Android kernel, you still are not supposed to be able to read the memory of the basement or somehow intersect with this operation, at least on the modern production smartphones. And the same goes around to the basement, which is not supposed to be able to access to uh, application processor directly. So, these two are mutually distrusting entities that are separated from each other and so there exists a privilege boundary which is which represents an attack, attack surface. Within the uh, real-time operating systems there are three large attack surfaces. Starting from right to left, the rightmost gray box represents the attack surface of the cellular stacks. Uh, this, this is the code which actually parses the cellular protocols. It usually runs in several distinct real-time operating system tasks. And this part of the attack surface handles all the layers of the protocol. There is a huge amount of parsing that happens here. The second box represents various management protocols. The simplest one to think about is the AT common protocol. It is still widely included in all basements and it's even usually exposed in some way to the application processor, so you can actually send some AT commands to the cellular modem. But a bit more interesting is the vendor-specific management protocols. One of them is the DIAC protocol. Because the basements, modern basements are very complex, so vendors need some sort of um, specialized protocol to enable configuration and diagnostics for the OMs. In case of Qualcomm, for example, DIAC is just one of the many diagnostic protocols involved. The third box is what I call the RTO score. It is various uh, core level functionality, such as the uh, code which implements the interface to the application processor. On the side of the application operating system, such as Android, there are also two attack surfaces that are attackable from the basement. The first one is uh, the peripheral drivers, because the basement is a separate hardware peripheral, so it requires some specialized drivers that handle I.O. and such things. And the second one is the attack surface represented with the various interface handlers, because um, the basement and uh, and the main operating system cannot communicate directly, they use some sort of a specialized interface to do that. In case of Qualcomm, this is shared memory. And so these uh, shared memory implementations are usually quite complex, and they represent an attack, an attack surface on the both sides. And finally, the third piece of this diagram is in the lowest part. I have depicted 
two great boxes which are related to the trusted execution environment. Because typically a modem, um, modem runs as a trustlet in a, in a secure environment, so technically the attack surfaces that exist within the trust zone or related to it also can be useful for um, baseband offensive research. Here we can distinguish at least two large attack surfaces. The first one is the secure manager uh, call handlers, which is the core interface that handles uh, calls from the application processor to the trust zone. And the second one are the trustlets, it's, uh, the uh, pieces of separate pieces of code which are executed and protected by the trust zone. On this diagram I have also added some information about data codecs. I'm not sure if they are supposed to be in the R2S core because these things are directly accessible from the cellular stacks usually, especially ASN1, which I have seen some bugs or reachable from the over-the-air interface. On this uh, diagram I have shown some example of vulnerabilities. I, I will not discuss them in details here since it's not the point of the presentation. But at least the ones from the Ponton you can find the write-ups on the internet. To discuss baseband offensive tools and approaches, I have narrowed down the previous diagram to just one attack surface, the over-the-air attack surface. This is the attack surface which is represented by parsing implementations of various cellular protocols inside the baseband operating system. And this is the attack surface that we can reach from uh, the air interface. In order to accomplish that, we need a um, transceiver such as software-defined radio or a mobile tester, which is able to talk the specific cellular protocol that we're planning to attack. The simplest way to accomplish this is use some sort of a software-defined radio, such as Atos Research SRP or Blade RF, and install um, open source implementation of a base station, such as OpenBTS or OpenBSC. The thing to note here is that the software-based implementations actually lag behind the development of technologies. The implementations of GSM base stations are very well established and popular, such as OpenBTS. And in fact, when I uh, tried to establish a BTS with uh, my user B, it was quite simple. For UMTS and LT, there exist less number of software-based implementations. And also there are more constraints on the hardware. For example, my model of the GSRP does not support um, UMTS due to resource constraints. And the most interesting thing here is that there does not exist any software-based implementation of the CDMA that you can use to establish a base station. This is a pseudo-random uh, diagram of the one of the Snapdragon chips. There exists a huge amount of various models of Snapdragons. This one I have chosen pseudo randomly when I was searching for some sort of um, visual diagram. Uh, Qualcomm used to include uh, some high-level diagrams of the architecture in their marketing materials previously, but it seems that they don't do this anymore. And this particular diagram is from a um, technical specification of a particular model, 820. Also, this particular model of Snapdragon is a bit interesting because it is the first one that included the artificial intelligence agent, which is also based on hexagon. For all purposes, the main interest here are the processors. 
majority of Snapdragons include quite a long list of processors. There are at least four ARM-based Cryo CPUs that actually run the ARM, the uh, Android, uh, and Android operating system. Then there are the Adreno GPUs, and then there are several hexagons. On the most recent models, there is not just one hexagon processing unit, but uh, several of them, and they are called respectively to their purposes. Each one of them, each one of these hexagon cores, is responsible for handling a specific functionality. For example, MDSP handles modem and runs the uh, real-time operating system. The ADSP handles media, and the CDSP handles compute. So the hexagons actually represent around one half of the processing power on modern Snapdragons. There are, um, there are two key points about the hexagon architecture from the hardware perspective. First of all, it is uh, hexagon is specialized to parallel processing. And so the first concept is variable sized instruction packets. It means that the several instructions can execute simultaneously on in separate execution units. It also uses a hardware multi-threading for the same purposes. On the right side of the slide here is some example of the hexagon assembly. It is quite funny at times. There's, uh, these uh, curly brackets represent the instructions that are executed simultaneously. And uh, these instructions must be compatible in order to be able to uh, use the distinct processing slots. And then there is the funny dot new notation, which actually enables the instructions to use both the old and the new value of a particular register within the same instruction cycle. This, uh, this provides quite a bit of optimization on the low level. For more information, I can direct you to the um, hexagon specification of Programmer's Reference Manual, which is available from the Qualcomm website. The concept of production fusing is quite common. As I said previously, it's a common practice from mobile device vendors to lock down the devices before they enter the market to prevent modifications and tinkering. And for the purposes of this locking down, they usually, there are um, uh, several ways how this can be accomplished. Usually various advanced diagnostic and debugging functionalities are removed from either software or hardware or both. It is quite common that these functionalities are only removed from software while the hardware remains here. And in such a case, uh, we will um, eventually the researchers will come up with uh, their own software-based implementation of this functionality, as in case of with some custom iOS kernel debuggers, for example. In case of Qualcomm, there was at some point a leaked internal memo which discusses what exactly they are doing for production fusing the devices. In addition to uh, production fusing, in case of uh, modern androids, the basement runs within the trust zone. And on my implementation, it is already quite locked down. It uses a separate component. The basement uses a separate component named the MBA, which stands from the Modern Basic Authenticator. And uh, this entire thing is run by the uh, subsystem of Android kernel named PIL, the Peripheral Image Loader. You can open the source code and investigate how exactly it looks. And the 
purpose of the MBA is to authenticate the modern firmware so that you would not be able to inject some arbitrary commands into the modern firmware and flash it. This is another uh, side of the hardening, so which makes it very difficult to inject any arbitrary code into the baseband. Basically, the only way to do this is through a software vulnerability. During this project, I have reverse engineered partially the hexagon modem firmware from my implementation, uh, from my um, Nexus 6B. The process of reverse engineering is not very difficult. First of all, you need to download the firmware from the website, from the Google's website for, in this case. Then you need to find the binary which corresponds to the modem firmware. The, uh, this binary is actually a um, compound binary that corresponds uh, that must be divided into separate binaries that represent specific sections inside the inside the firmware. And for that purpose, we can use the unified trustlet script. After you have split the basement firmware into separate sections, you can load them into Ida Pro. There are several. Uh, plugins available for Ida Pro that support Hexagon. I have tried one of them, I think it was GSMK, and it works quite good for basic curves engineering purposes. Uh, notably here is that some sections of the modern firmware are compressed and relocated at runtime, so you would not be able to re uh, reverse engineer them and unless you can decompress them, which is also a bit of a challenge because the Qualcomm uses some internal compression algorithm for, for that. For the reverse engineering, uh, the main approach here is to get started with some root points. For example, because this is a real-time operating system, we know that it should have some task structures and task structures that we can locate and from there we can locate some interesting code. In case of hexagon this is a bit non-trivial because as I said it doesn't have any lock strings so even though you may locate something like, that looks like a task struct but it's not clear which code does it actually represent. So the first step here is to apply the lock strings that were removed from the binary by QShrink the, I think the only way to do it is by using the uh, msg underscore hash txt file from the leaked sources. This file is not supposed to be available neither on the mobile devices nor in some open ecosystem. And after you have applied these log strings, you will create you will be able to rename some functions and based on these log strings and because the log strings often contain the names of the source file, source module, from which the code was built, so it uh, creates um, opportunity to understand what what exactly this code is doing. Debugging was not was completely unavailable in my case, and I realized that it would require some couple of months more work to make it work. And the, the only way, I think, and the best way is to create a software-based debugger similar to ModKit, the, uh, the publication that I will, will be referencing in the references uh, based on a software vulnerability in either the modem itself or in some authentic authenticator or in the trust zone so that we can inject a software debugger callbacks into the baseband and connect it to the GDB stop. This is how the part of the firmware looks that has the log string stripped out. Here it already has some names applied using IDA script, so of course there was no such names initially, only the hashes. Each one of these hashes represent a log string that you can take in the, f from the message hash file. And here is what you can get after you have applied the textual messages and renamed some functions. 
In this case, you would be able to find some hundred of procedures that are directly related to the DIAC subsystem. And in a similar way, you can uh, locate various subsystems related to over-the-air vectors as well. But unfortunately, majority of the OTA, OTA vectors are located in the segments that are not immediately available in the firmware, the ones that are compressed and relocated. Meanwhile, I have tried many different things during this project. The things that definitely worked is building the MSM kernel. There is nothing special about this, just a regular cross build. Another common, commonly well-known offensive approach is firmware downgrades. When you take some old firmware that contains a well-known security vulnerability and flash it and use the bug to create an exploit to um, achieve some additional functionality or introspection into the system. This part definitely works. Uh, downgrades are trivial both on the entire firmware and the modem as well as the trust zone. I did try to build the Qualcomm firmware from the lead source codes. I assigned just a few days to this task since it's not mission critical and I have run out of time. Probably was different version of source codes. But actually this is uh, not a critical project because building a leaked firmware is not directly relevant to finding new bugs in the production firmware. So I just set it aside for some later investigation. I have also investigated the RAM dumps ecosystem a little bit on the software side at least and it seems that it's also fused quite reliably. This is when I remembered about the Qualcomm DAG. During the initial reconnaissance I stumbled on some white papers and slides that mentioned the Qualcomm Diagnostic Protocol. And it seemed like quite a powerful protocol, specifically with respect to reconfiguring the baseband. So I decided to, first of all, to test it, in the case that it would actually provide some advanced introspection functionality, and then probably to use it, to use the protocol for enabling log, log dumps. Qualcomm Diag or QCDM is a proprietary protocol developed by Qualcomm with the purposes of advanced baseband software configuration and diagnostics. It is mostly aimed for OM developers, not for users. The Qualcomm um, Direct protocol consists of around 200 commands, at least in theory, that are, some of them are quite powerful on paper, such as downloader mode and read-write memory. Initially, uh, the uh, DIAC was partially reverse engineered around 2010 and included in the open source project named Modem Manager. And then it was also exposed in a presentation at the Chaos Communication Progress, uh, Chaos Communication Congress 2011 by Guillaume Delucre. This, uh, I think this presentation popularized it. And this is the one that introduced me to this protocol. Unfortunately, that presentation is not really relevant, majority of it, to uh, modern production phones. But it does provide a high-level overview and a um, general expectation of what you will have to deal with. From the offensive perspective, the DIAC protocol represents a local attack vector from the application processor to the baseband. A common scenario of how it can be useful is unlocking mobile phones which are locked to a particular mobile carrier. If we find a memory corruption vulnerability in DIAC protocol, it may be possible to execute a call directly on the basement and change some internal settings. This is usually accomplished historically through the AT common handlers, but internal proprietary protocols are 
also very convenient for that. The second scenario, how the direct offensive can be useful, is using it for ejecting a software-based debugger. Uh, if you can find a bug in Dialog that enables uh, read-write capability on the basement, you can inject some debugging hooks and eventually connect it to a GDB stub. So it, it enables to create a software-based debugger even when GTAC is not available. What has changed in DIAC in 10 years, based on some cursory investigation that I did? First of all, the original publication mentioned uh, Qualcomm baseband based on ARM and with uh, Rex operating system. All modern Qualcomm basebands are based on Hexagon as opposed to ARM, and the Rex operating system was replaced with Kurt, which uh, I think it still has some bits of Rex, but in general it's a different operating system. Majority of super powerful commands of DIAX, such as download or mode and memory read write, were removed, at least on my device. And also it does not expose any immediately available interfaces, such as USB channel. I hear that it's possible to enable the USB direct channel by adding some special boot properties um, but usually it's not it wouldn't be available it shouldn't be expected to be available on all devices so these observations were based on my test device Nexus XP and this sh this should be around a medium level of hardening more modern devices such as Google Pixels, the modern ones, should be expected to be even more hardened than that, especially on the Google side because they take hardening very seriously. As opposed to it, on the other side of the spectrum, if you think about some no-name modem sticks, these things can be more open and more easy to investigate. The DIAC implementation architecture is relatively simple. This diagram is based roughly on the same diagram that I presented in the beginning of the talk. On the, light si on the, on the left side there is the Android kernel, and on the right side there is the basement operating system. Uh, DIAC protocol actually it works in both sides. It's not only commands that can be sent by the application processor to the basement but it's also the messages that can be sent by the basement to the application processor. So the commands are not really commands, they're more like tokens that also can be used to encode messages. The green arrows on this slide represent an exemplar, an example of a call flow, uh, of a data flow originating from the basement and going to the application processor. So obviously in case of commands, the, there would be a reverse call flow our data flow. The main entity inside the operating system, basement operating system, responsible for DIAG is the DIAG task. It has a separate task which handles specifically various operations related to the DIAG protocol. The uh, the exchange of data between the DIAC task and other tasks are done through the ring buffer. So, for example, if um, if some tasks if some task needs to log log something through the DIAC, it will use um, specialized logging APIs that will in turn put the logging data into the ring buffer. The ring buffer will be drained either on timer or on a software-based interrupt from, um, from the caller. And it, at this point, the data will be wrapped into DIA protocol. And from there, it will go to CO task, the serial aisle, which is responsible to send in the output to a specific interface this is based on the modem uh, on the basement configuration.
The main interface that I was dealing with is the shared memory, which ends up in the direct share driver in, in, inside the Android kernel. So in case of sending the commands from the Android kernel to the baseband, it will be the reverse flow. The first, you will need to send some uh, to, uh, to craft the Diag protocol data, send it through the Diag share driver, that will write to the shared memory interface. From there, it will go to the specialized specialized task in the baseband, and eventually end up in the Diag task and potentially in other responsible task. On the Android side, Diag is represented with the dev Diag device which is implemented with the Diagcher and Diag forward kernel drivers in the MSM kernel. The purpose of the Diagcher driver is to support the Diag interface. It is um, quite, it's quite complex in, in code, but functionally it's quite simple. It contains some basic minimum of Diag commands that enable configuration of the interface on the baseband side. And then it would be able to multiplex the Diag channel to either USB or memory device. It also contains some IOCTLs to, uh, for configuration that can be accessed from the Android user land. And finally, Diagchar filters various Diag commands that it considers unnecessary. This is a bit important because when you will start when you will try to do some tests and send some arbitrary Diag commands through the Diag interface, you would be required to rebuild the Diag share driver to remove, to remove this masking. Otherwise, your commands will not make it to the baseband side. At the core, the Diag share driver is based on the SMD shared memory device interface, which is a core interface specific to Qualcomm modem. So this is where Diag is, uh, Diag chair is on the diagram. The Diag chair driver itself is located in the application OS, vendor specific drivers. And then there is the, some shared memory implementation in the basement that handles this and the Diag implementation itself. Diagshare driver is quite complex in code, but the functionality is quite simple. It, it does implement a handful of ICTLs that enable some configuration. I, I didn't check what exactly these ICTLs are responsible for. It exposes the dev Diag device, which is available for reading and writing. However, by default, you are not able to access the Diag channel based on uh, for this device, because in order to access it, there is a Diag switch login function, which switches the channel to uh, that is used for uh, Diag communications. On this screen, there are several modes listed, but in practice, only two of them are supported, the USB mode and the memory device mode. USB mode is the default, so which is why if you just open the dev diag driver, uh, dev diag device, and try to read something from it, it won't work. It's tied to USB, and in order to reconfigure it to use the memory device, you need to send a special IOCTL code. Notice the procedure named mask request validate, which employs a quite a strict filtering on the Diag commands that you try to send through this interface. So it filters out basically everything with the exception of some basic configuration requests. At the core, Diag chart driver uses the shared memory device to communicate with the baseband. 
the SMD implementation is quite complex. Uh, it exposes SMD read API, which is used by Dagger, for reading the data from the shared memory. It's one of the APIs. Uh, shared memory also operates on the abstraction of channels, which are accessed through the API named SMD named opening H. So you can notice here that there are some direct specific channels that can be opened. Now let's take a look at the SMD implementation. This is a bit important because the shared memory device represents a part of the attack surface for escalation from the modem to the application processor. This is a very important attack surface because if you just achieve code execution on the basement, it's mostly useless because it cannot access the main operating system. And in order to make it useful, you will need to chain the to create an exploit chain and add one more exploit based on that bug with the privilege escalation from the modem to the application processor. So shared memory device is one of the attack surfaces for this. The shared memory device is implemented as um, exposed my region, exposed by the Qualcomm peripheral the specialized MSM driver will map it, and here it's the name SMM RAMFIS, the base of the uh, shared memory region. The shared memory region is operates on the concepts of entries and channels. So it's partitioned in distant parts that can be accessed through the procedure SMM get entry. And one of these entries is SMM channel alloc TBL, which contains the um, list of available channels that can be opened. From there, we can actually open the channels and use the shared memory interface. During this initial research project, it wasn't my goal to, to research the entire Qualcomm ecosystem. So while I was preparing for this talk, I have noticed some more interesting things in the source codes, such as, for example, the specialized driver that handles a GTAG my region, which is presumably exposed by some Qualcomm system on chips. In the drivers, this is mostly used read-only, and I suppose that it will not really work for writing, but it's worth checking, probably. And now, finally, let's look at the DIAC protocol itself. One of the first things that I noticed when researching the DIAC protocol is that it's actually used in a few places, not only in libqcdm. A popular tool named Snoop Snitch can enable protocol dumps, cellular pro protocol dumps on rooted devices. And in order to accomplish this, Snoop Snitch sends an opaque blob of DIAC commands to the mobile device through the DIAC interface. This blob is not, doc is not documented, so it got me curious what exactly these commands are doing. But before we can look at the dump, Let's understand the protocol. The DIAC protocol consists of around 200 of commands or tokens. Some of them are documented in the open source, but not all of them. So you can notice on the screenshots, some of the commands are missing. And one of the missing commands is actually the token 92 in hexadecimal, which represents an uh, encoded uh, hash log message. The command format is quite simple. Uh, it's The base primitive here is the direct token number 7e. It's not really a delimiter, it's a separate direct command 126. It's missing 
in the open source as you can see here. So the dial command is nested. The outer layer consists of the, uh, this wrapper of 7e hexadecimal bytes. Then there is the main command. And then there is the, some variable length data that can contain even more subcommands. This entire thing is uh, verified using the CRC and some bytes are escaped, specifically as you can see on the snippet. One interesting thing about the DIA protocol is that it supports subsystem extensions. Basically, different subsystems in the baseband can register their own DIA system handlers, arbitrary ones, and there is a special DIA command, number 75, which simply forwards, instructs the DIAC system to forward this command to the respective subsystem. And then it will be parsed there. The, there exists quite a large number of subsystems. Not all of them are documented. And when I started investigating this, I noticed that there actually exists a DIAC subsystem subsystem and um, debugging subsystem. The latter one immediately interested me because I was hoping that it would enable some more advanced introspection through this debugging subsystem. But it turned out that the debugging subsystem is quite simple. It only supported one command, inject crash. So you can send a special dia command that will inject the crash into the baseband. I will talk later about this. Now let's take a look at specific examples of the DAG protocol. This is the uh, annotated snippet of the blob of comments from Snoop Snitch. This blob actually uh, consists of three large logical parts. The first part is largely irrelevant. It's a bunch of comments that request various informations from the baseband, such as timestamp, version info, build ID, and so on. The second bunch of comments starts with a comment number 73 hexadecimal. This is um, the command log config. This is the comment which enables protocol dumps and configures them. And the third part of this blob starts with the command number 7d hexadecimal. This is the command x message config. This is actually the command that is supposed to enable textual message logging, except that in the case of the snoop snitch, it disables all logging altogether. So how do actually uh, cellular protocol dumps work? In order to enable the cellular protocol dumps, we need a um, Diag command log config number 73 hexadecimal. It is partially documented in the libqcdm. The structure of the packet would contain the code and the subcommand that would be set mask in this case. It also needs an equipment ID which corresponds to the specific protocol that we want to dump. And finally the masks that are applied to um, filter some parts of the dump. This is relatively straightforward. And now the second um, command, the command x message config. This is the one which is supposed to enable textual message logs. This, uh, the command format is undocumented, so let's take a closer look at it. The, the command consists of a subcommand. In this case, it's subcommand number four, the set mask. And then there are two 16-bit integers, SSID start and end. SSID is a subsystem ID, which is not the same as the DIAC subsystems. And the last one is the mask. So subsystem IDs are used to filter the messages based on a specific subsystem. Because the, there is a huge amount of subsystems in the basement, and if all of them start logging, this is a huge amount of data. So DIA provides this capability to filter a little bit to a specific subsystems that you're interested in. 
the, the snippet of Python code here is an example how to enable textual message logging for all subsystems. You will need to set the mask to all ones. And this is quite a lot of logging in my experience. Now, for parsing the incoming log messages, there are two types of Diag tokens. Both of them are undocumented. The first one is a legacy message, number 79, hexadecimal. This is a simple ASCII-based message that arrives through the Diag interface, so you can parse it quite straightforwardly. The second one is, I called it Diag command log hash, it's number 92 hexadecimal. This is the token which encodes the log messages that contain, of, that contain only the hashes. This is the one that if you have the message hash, message hash.txt file, you can correspond the hash arrived, that was arrived through this command to the messages provided in the text file and you can get the text or logs. On the lower part of the slide there are two examples of hex dumps for both commands. Both of them have a similar structure. First there are four bytes that are essential. The first one is the command itself. And the third byte is quite interesting, is the number of arguments included. Next there is the 64-bit value of timestamp. Next there is the SSID value, 16-bit, some line number. And I'm not sure what is the next argument. And finally, after that, there is either a ASCII encoded log string in plain text or a hash of the log string. And optionally there may be included some arguments. So in case of um, the first legacy command, the arguments are included before the log message. And in case of the second command, they are included after the MD MD5 hash of the log message, at least in my version of this implementation. And this is a Diag packet that enables you to inject a crash into the baseband, at least in theory. Because in my case it did not work. And by not working I mean that it did simply nothing to the baseband. Normally I would expect that on production device it should just reset the baseband. You will not get a crash dump or anything like that, it's just, just a reset. So I suppose that it still should be working on some other devices, so it's worth it of checking. There are a few types of crashes that you can request in this way. In order to accomplish this, I needed a very simple tool with basically two functions. First, uh, direct easy access to the Diac interface, ideally through some sort of Python shell, and second is the ability to read and parse data with advanced log strings. For that purpose I wrote a simple framework that I named DiagTalk, which is um, based directly on the DevDiag interface in the Android kernel and with a Python harness. So. On the left side here is an example of some advanced parsing with some leaked values. And on the right side here is the example of the advanced message log, which includes the log strings that were extracted, uh, that were stripped out from the firmware. The log is quite fun, as I expect it to be. It has a lot of uh, de detailed data, such as, for example, GPS coordinates and various attempts of the baseband to connect to different channels. And I think it's quite useful for offensive research purposes. It even contains sometimes raw pointers, as you can notice in the screenshot. So, in this project, my conclusion was that 
indeed, uh, I was reassured that it was the right choice and hexagon seems to be quite a challenging target. And it would probably need several more months of work to even begin to do some serious offensive work. I also started to think about writing a software debugger because it seems to be the most probably the most reliable way to achieve uh, debugging introspection. And also I noticed some black spaces in the field that may require future work. For Qualcomm Hexagon specifically, there is a lot of things that can be done. For example, you can take a look at other Qualcomm proprietary diagnostic protocols, of which there are a few such as QMI, for example, I think they are lesser known than DIAC protocol. And then there is a requirement to create a full system emulation based on Camel, at least for some chips. And a big problem about the decompiler, which is a major obstacle to any serious static analysis in the code, For the offensive research, there are three large directions. First one is enabling debugging. There are different ways for that. For example, software-based debugging or bypassing the JTAG fusing, on the other hand. Next, there are explorations of the over-the-air attack vectors. And the third one is escalation from the baseband to the application processor. These are the three large offensive research vectors. And for the basements in general, there also exist some interesting directions of future work. First of all, the Osmo Combi B. It definitely de deserves some update a little bit. It is the only one open source implementation of the basement, and it is so outdated and there is uh, and it is based on some really obscure hardware. Another problem here is that it doesn't, there doesn't exist any software-based CDMA implementation. Elisa, thank you very much for this nice talk. Um, there are some questions from the audience. So basically the first one is a little bit of an icebreaker. Do you use an, a mobile phone and do you trust it? No, I don't really use a mobile phone, only for Twitter. Does anyone still use mobile phones nowadays? <laughs> well, no idea. <laughs> okay, uh, another question uh, concerns the, the other Qualcomm chips. Um, do you did you have a look at the Qualcomm Wi-Fi chipset? As I mentioned during the talk, I had only one month. It was like a short reconnaissance project, so I didn't really have time to investigate everything. I did notice that uh, Qualcomm SOX have a um, Wi-Fi chip, which is also based on Hexagon, and more than that, it also shares some of the same low-level technical primitives, so it's um, definitely worth looking, but I didn't investigate it in details. Okay, okay, thanks. Well, and there is also a pretty technical question here, so instead of having to go through the rigorous command checking for the DIAC car driver, wouldn't it be possible to mmap uh, def mem into user space process? and send over commands directly, so depends a little bit on what the goal is. Okay, so it really depends on your previous background and your goals. The point here is that by default the Diagshare ecosystem does not allow to send arbitrary Diag commands. So either way you will have to hack something. One way to hack this is to rebuild the Diagshare driver so you would be able to send the commands directly through the dev Diag interface. Another way would be to access the shared memory directly, for example. But I think it would be more complex because the Qualcomm shared memory implementation is quite complex. So
So I think that uh, the easiest way would be actually to hook the director driver and use the dev direct interface for this. Okay. Yeah. Thanks. Thanks. Um, well, is this? There's one question which is a little bit um, tricky to read out. Maybe you can make sense of it. Is this typically good security for the mobile phones? So. This uh, level of hardening that I presented, I think, is around medium level. So usually production phones are even more hardened if you take a look at things like Google Pixel 5 or mm -hmm. the latest iPhones. They would be even better hardened than the one that I discussed. Oh, okay. Yeah. Thanks. Thanks, Dan. So it doesn't look like we have any more questions left. Anyway, so if you want to get in contact with Alisa, no problem. There is the feedback uh, tab below your video now at the moment. Just drop your questions over there, and uh, that's a way to get in touch with Alisa. Other than that, I would say we are done for today for this session. Thank you very, very much, Alisa, for this really nice presentation once again as well. And I'll transfer now over to the Herald News Show.